stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building, and our guests are comedian, author, Judy Carter, and photographer, Jack English. Stand-up comedian, author, motivational speaker, and workshop organizer or leader, Judy Carter was born and raised in Los Angeles. She graduated from Fairfax High School and USC with a Bachelor of Arts in Theater Arts, and she's had a career in stand-up. She's written books about stand-up, and it's your competition you've written books about. <laughs> so what does that mean, that you would write about your competition? Oh, I get hate mail <laughs> from stand-up comics going, why are you teaching people how to become stand-up comics? You're ruining things. Yeah, well, have you? Uh, <laughs> You're uh, not a stand-up comic anymore, right? Have you heard of uh, Seth Rogen? Yeah. He started my class. Well, you haven't oh, ruined it, have you? No. You've just made it better. Yes. And you're making it better. I'm sure that's what you had in mind, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what do the workshops do? My workshops now are from my new book called The Message of You because Isn't I that? believe that everybody has a TED Talk in them. Everybody <gasps> has a message that you were, baby, you were born to tell. Hard to do. No, it's I not. I think it is because the TED Talks are always so interesting. Well, I coach people. And what we do, and a lot of people learn it from going step by step through the message of you book. The message and, of you. And, and what you do is that you look at your day. And within each day, in an ordinary day, there are extraordinary stories. And so I help people find those stories and then find that message. Because let's face it, Joan. At your message is going to be told, your story is going to be told. Unfortunately, for most people, it's at their funeral, right? That's really true. Isn't it true? And everybody yeah. gets up and tells stories. Oh. And you go, well, I know what that person stands for. So, and I didn't know they did that. Or I didn't know that they were so yeah. adept at something. And I should have returned <laughs> should return their phone call. No, no, not that. <laughs> but I mean, it is surprising sometimes when you read an obituary, what you're saying is like, I didn't know they did that, or I right. didn't know they did that. So what if, what if we can know our message while we are alive? <laughs> right. Right? Don't wait to die and then stand up and learn how to deliver it in a compelling way. That's what I'm all about right now. That's what you're talking about. One of the things, your mother had a shop in Beverly Hills? Yes, My Flair Lady, it was called. Um, my I, Flair Lady. I, I called it Jews for polyester. She <laughs> was was it like, polyester? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It, well, it was during the, you know, the 70s and the 80s where it's like, you know, that was, that was like, wow. Plastic. And your father? My father worked for the city, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. He was a mechanical engineer. So when your mother was at My Flair Lady, did you come and help her? No. You didn't? No. Is that well, bad? Then, I feel I was, guilty? Well, no, but that was what I was going to ask you is did you hear those stories from there? Because there were like, I, I don't know, you, you talked about an ordinary day. My grandmother. Um. My grandmother was the stories, I would say. Grandma, you came here to Los Angeles in 1926. Why didn't you buy something? And uh -oh. she would go, Beverly Hills, it was a bean field. What? I'm going to be a bean farmer. Right. <laughs> and I would sit in her kitchen eating a bagel and a soft-boiled egg <gasps> mm. and her 
cookies <laughs> that she kept in a U-Band coffee can along with the, her, her bank, her money, that she'd always have the bottom it's under so the cookies. It's so typical, but, you know, kids today don't understand that. I know just what you're talking about. And I listened to her stories, and I have to tell you, Joan, that was the happiest point mm. of my life. And we all have to know the stories of where we come from. So your, your viewers, I want to say to you people watching, right. interview your grandparents. So many know people their say that. story. But we don't do it. But you, I mean, you're motivating people to do that. And you're motivating it through this book because if you write about yourself, you have to ask those questions, don't you? You yes. have to find out how those have enhanced your life. Those yes. stories have enhanced your life. And use those stories to right. inspire other people. So it's not an act of narcissism. I mean, we're in Los Angeles, Which land one? of profound narcissism. Me, 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 me. Yes. <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> so how do we use these stories to, um, to connect with other people and to inspire other people? So a lot of my clients now when I coach people are CEOs who want to, oh, in a meeting, be right, able to speak, be right, able to connect, right. be able to fire up their staff. How do you do it? What story is the right story to, to do that? What's the story you need to have on your website? But you come in and do that. You teach them, right, yes. what to do or how to, to, how to affect their company. More yes. or less. I'm creating, how do you do that? I'm creating the Message of You University online. <laughs> message of You? The Message of You, You. you. <laughs> right. Message of You, You. Oh, you're right. right. I got it. The Message of You. And, you. and I have w some workshops in Los Angeles, San Francisco. It's all on my website, so, Judy Carter. So who tells you, Judy? Does the CEO come in and say, this is what we do? Or do you research it yourself? And oh, you come no. to him and you tell him, this is what I'm going to do? Well, I do it over Skype, and I ask them some questions. I ask them, mostly, if you look at the word message, the <laughs> yeah. secret is right there. G? No. Oh. The, you can't spell message mess? <laughs> without the first four letters. The mess. Mess. I ask them, what are the big challenges you've had in your childhood? To it, the CEO? Oh, yeah, because unless you, you know, t aren't, our times now are, you, your CEOs aren't lofty people. They're like, you know, the, Mr. Marriott of Marriott Hotels. He talks about his son passing and he talks about his heart attack. It's about being personal and, and talking about why are you committed? What happened? And, and I, t I tell people that everybody has had a challenge in their childhood that has Formed their success. You can't have a success without a mess. I'm a professional. Without a mess? Yes. That's really interesting because we were talking about that this morning at the gym, how the child is formed from 1 to what, 15 or 16? Yes. And you can mess them up so much during that time, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's where they're finding the messes. And you can't their... see it without the last three letters. Right. Age. age. Until you get age. You need some Excellent. age to see your mess. your mess. And, you know, the paint, like, I get paid to, as a professional speaker. Now, as a child, when I went to Hancock Park Elementary School, they assumed I was retarded because I had a severe speech impediment. And your stand up? Look at that. Yes, and I have found everybody's like that. Walt Disney grew up in a very unhappy home, an alcoholic. That's what. That's what moved him to create the happiest place on earth. But you guys, y you people, you people who are looking for this, looking for the story, um, have to find it and have to make it better. A lot of people don't, can't do that, can't find it. They can. <laughs> they can if they put their, their cell phones down. Oh, you put your cell phone down and occupy your life. Occupy uh, the pain and the successes, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the everything. In other words, we like to focus on the things we did right and the things we didn't. Forget the things we did. Right. But you learn, I guess, if you're, if, if, over age, over time, I guess if you look at what the mess was, you can make it better or you can see that it could be better or As you've a, made yeah. it better. As a comedian, you know, there's a line about all comedians know that 
that comedy is tragedy right. plus time. I think Carol plus Burnett time. has said yeah. Carol Burnett has said that and and it takes time, <clears throat> but I found this work is extended from my work teaching people comedy because that was all about turning problems into punchlines. Right. And when people came to me and went, Oh, I had a wonderful life, everything's great, you know? You, <laughs> oh my god, I have so much money, I don't know what to do with it and you know, I just can't seem to gain any weight. How did you? I can't <laughs> gain any weight. I can't lose any weight. <laughs> They're not funny. How did, how did you get into stand-up like that? I mean, it's like you, you sit here and you say a couple of things and you light up. Where a lot of people can't do that. I don't know how a person does yeah, that. Yeah, well, you know what? You light up when you are in touch with your life, when you occupy your life. But if you have spent your life pushing, trying to forget things, pushing them mm -hmm. away, you become dead. No truth. Yes. You have to face honesty. But when you face your authenticity and you live it and you be it and you are it, you start having these light bulbs come up, out and, and, and you become alive. And then you get an overwhelming desire to share, which uh. is very healthy. But when you stand up and you're funny about these things, I mean, to be funny about these problems that you've had, it's hard to stand up and do that and be funny and laugh, just like you're doing that now. Well, you're laughing at me. But <laughs> TED Talks are not, not necessarily funny. No, they're not. So <laughs> you don't have to be funny. That's why I think storytelling and speaking and the whole business of speaking, people really don't know that it is a money-making career and that companies and meetings are looking for people who oh, have so great stories oh, to right. come in and liven things up. Well, I think that is manifest itself in the fact that you have contributed to NPR on so many different issues, that you've uh, uh, been a keynote speaker at so many big commercial uh, operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you still do stand-up? No. Oh, you do not. Oh no, I, I don't gone? do. I don't do stand up because I had an epiphany, and that was it was a terrible gig on Long Island, governors where everybody was drunk and oh. screaming and heckling. <laughs> you suck. Oh. You think you're fu you're not funny. Oh, and that's oh, before they did? that's before I got on stage. Oh. <laughs> That's why I'm walking to oh, the stage, stop. and I looked at the audience. It was like a Fellini film with everybody, you know, slow motion. And I realized at that moment, making drunks laugh was something I did at the dinner table, and I don't want to do it anymore. Oh, wow. That's when I became an author, and that's what changed my life when, when Oprah had me on her show and held up a book that 59 agents rejected. Yeah, that's what's so great, right? You kept at it, though. <laughs> 59 times you get rejected? Yeah, and I meet, <laughs> I meet like, I meet an agent in a Weight Watcher meeting, and, <laughs> and I'm going like, I had 59 agents oh, rejected, and she's in Weight Watchers. I'll read it. Oh, she I'll read loved it. it. <laughs> that's how it happened? Yeah. And then um, Random House loved it, and oh, another wow. person loved it, wow. Oprah Winfrey. Wow. So I say to your, your audience, you know, when you are living on purpose and when you have your story and you have your message and you're compelled to don't give up on it, you're going to have obstacles I know. that and, test you. But one of the things that I left out of your resume, and I think you were kind of doing it here, mess and age and putting it together, was that you were a magician? Yes, <laughs> because I had a speech. Money. I had a speech impediment, and I couldn't speak. <laughs> so I just got very involved with newspaper, tearing it up and putting it back. And I and it ended up as a career, unbelievable, carrying with enormous freight and luggage into one day. Thanks to United Airlines, um, my luggage did not show up. <laughs> and it was in Chicago where they go, uh, you're They're, going yeah. on, little lady. I don't care your little tricks didn't show up. And I went, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I went Your on. little tricks didn't show up. <laughs> went on. I was funny, and I became a comic. Well, we're so glad you came, Judy. Thank you so much. You would be a great speaker. Take a uh, copy of my book. Take I would it home. Love. Thank you. The message of you.
Love your house, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> we'll be right back with Jack English. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum, and I'm with photographer Jack English, who was born and raised in Leicester, England, went to Ashby Grammar School there in his little community, and he's had a variety of experiences on his way to his full-time photographic career. Jack worked at the International Telephone Exchange in London, also at a clothing shop in Covent Garden. He did costuming for films. He did styling for fashion magazines. And the big thing is, to me, he worked on an oil rig in the North Sea. Then he ended up in a London restaurant where it was a turning point for his career in photography. He's had exhibitions worldwide, and uh, it seems that he is a specialist in filming on the sets, stills, they call it. So we'll find out about that. But let's go through this a little bit, Jack. Sure. Let's, let's <laughs> see what uh, we did at the International Phone Exchange. Oh, it was the, it's the first job I had when I moved to London, and... Um, I could speak a little bit of French, and, uh, oh. and so they put me in the linguist section of mm. the International Telephone Exchange, and it seemed like a, a reasonable job at the time, which it was. It was uh, but it wasn't what you wanted. Was no, it, was I, mean, none, I mean, none of the things that you've described are really what I wanted to do. Well, but what about from, a shop, the, clothing shop? I mean, I think all yeah, of this kind of goes uh, into uh, photography, it goes into I, your background. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I mean, I've always been interested in clothes, music, and the cinema. Uh, the three prevailing things that have always interested me, but um, I guess with what I did for a living, that kind of stopped and started a lot, <laughs> to say the least. It, well, did did styling come into that? Was yes. that part of it? Yeah, did yeah, that get you yeah. into films? Um, well, uh, I was working with two other guys, and one of them was asked to provide the clothes for a film called Quadrophenia. So, yeah, we, um, we were, yeah, I was interested in that. Was a big film, in, wasn't it? Well, yeah, it was, and it was a um, something that interested me. That that time period, those those kids and what they wore, music, and, uh, and the, yeah, and, and the who were involved, and um, so that kind of interested me at the and time. Did, how did you research what to to? Well, I knew because I was part of that movement, you know, <laughs> and uh, in its in its sort of infancy, and so I, I kind of instinctively knew. Although they didn't. Um, go along with a lot of what we, or a lot of what I suggested. Um, oh, they did. <laughs> oh no, no. So I suppose that was a good experience. My what an early experience of the film is yeah, was having to compromise. And this and styling kind of is the same yeah. kind of thing you do yeah. in, in yeah. your work now. Maybe not. Maybe you don't style um, it, but you have to know that, right? It, well, I do. If um, I get asked to do special shoots on movies, you know, where whereby you're sort of you're shooting the poster and and, um, mm. and specials of actors that, you know, when they're not actually filming on the set. I could but see all of these kind of uh, fashion-related, music-related things working for you and your business right now, your chosen path. I don't see an oil rig. <laughs> Tell I me don't about know. that. I don't, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's not really a chosen path. I've just kind of gone with the flow. Um, now the, the the thing was working on oil rigs and uh, but it was well, a long time. Well, yeah, no, I mean my mother died. I was distraught and uh, not in good shape. And um, I was I'll never forget it. I was on the I was on the underground in London and I was I was washing dishes for my brother who had a restaurant in 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 Borough Market. He after my mother died, he said, "Look, just come to London and give me a hand in the restaurant to try and get me back on my feet," and uh, which I did. And um, that provided me with some structure, I suppose, to my to my to my life. And um, I, f I found and I picked up a newspaper on the on the on the subway, oh, oh. and there was an ad in it which just said the word Madagascar stood out. And uh, anyway, so I, I went along for this job. Uh, that was pretty cool. You were and, alone. And, that was yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah, no, Madagascar. It was like, yeah, yeah, Madagascar appealed to me. Where it was, is it? It was a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was amazing. It was a great escape. It was like. You in a there? sense, it was like joining the Foreign Legion or something. You're right. So, yeah, I was there two years. I loved it. But did you have to have any kind of physical well, qualities? 
Well, I went. I remember going in an old pair of jeans like this and a Levi jacket, and there was a few guys there in suits, and they gave me the gig. So oh. um, maybe that helps. But um, I wasn't qualified to do, you know, what I said I could do. And so after after a period of time, I got fired. But um, but did they have a lot of people coming, to answering those ads and coming? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Did yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty. It it's, is. Anyway, no, you know, a few days later, I was on a plane to to Madagascar, you know, an Air France flight. To you know, yeah, to Madagascar, and did, which, was, did the, which was great. Did your French help you? French? A little, yeah. Did it? Yeah, it's a French colony, sure. Yeah. And then what about working at the restaurant? Because it seems your brother had a big, a my big. Brother, uh, yeah, my brother had a huge inspiration influence on me. Yeah, he's he's a good photographer. He's he's a an avant-garde filmmaker. Oh, and, he is. Yeah, and. Um, I remember I had this idea that I wanted to do a series of interviews. Um, this was, I think it was probably in the mid-70s, and one of the people that I wanted to interview was Kenneth Anger. And uh, so off I went to New York to interview Kenneth Anger, and my brother was very helpful with the questions. Oh, oh, he did? Yeah, yeah, because um, he, he knew a lot more about Kenneth Anger than I did. Were you interviewing him or were you photographing him both. as well? Both. I did both. Oh, you were do doing both? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, see. I that was see. an experience in itself. What kind, what kind of a restaurant did your brother have? Vegetarian. That was pretty yeah, yeah, was new a, yeah. at that time, wasn't it? it? At, at that time it was, yeah. It was particularly where it was as well. It was in Borough Market, which is near London Bridge. So did, it once was, that came was a, Yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a kind of... Um, it was far ahead of first time. It was ahead of its time, <laughs> yeah. Like my brother. He was ahead of his time? Yeah, he still is. He still is? Yeah. What's he doing now? He, d he makes films. He's uh, a broadcaster on the radio. Oh, he is? Yeah. In uh, England? In, yeah, in England, in London, yeah. Uh, Resonance radio station. Yeah, which is a you know, great station, and he's very good. So once you did the Kenneth Anger, yeah. and you knew how to start asking questions and taking yeah. photographs along yeah. the way, did it get published? It did. It got published in, an, in, a, in a magazine in California called On Film, and uh, in London it got published in a magazine called Time Out. Oh, and I know Time Out. And, Tony, uh, Tony yeah. Elliott started Time yeah. Out at that time. And, uh, you know, and I was thrilled that it, that it did. That was great. So that, yeah. was that your first fling into being a photographer? Um, I guess. I mean, what, what? I mean, I read. A, I led a very hedonistic lifestyle. I mean, I was sort of. <laughs> I, I mean, know. I was brought up. At, I went through the '60s. You know, I took a lot of drugs and drank a lot of booze, and uh, it, I kind of finally made a decision to to take up photography when I when I when I put the the drink and the drugs down, and I thought, well, well why not pursue something you've always wanted to do, which was photography. So you put those down. What yeah. kind of camera did you pick up? In the, in the beginning, I just all I wanted to do, I was very in awe of people like Avedon and Irving Penn, mm. great American photographers, and all I wanted to do was shoot black and white portraits. So I, I borrowed a, you know, a, a camera, and there was a guy called Alan Strutt, who had a studio called Lipstick um, in the East End of London, who kind of was very helpful. In, I didn't know anything about lighting or anything like that. I knew so what I wanted. you didn't take any classes? No, no. So not it's all, all self-taught? Yeah, and I... Started to kind of just shoot people that um, that I'd met in AA meetings. Basically, that's how I started. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked them. Big obviously. stores, right? No, no, no. Just just people I knew. Just I, I didn't want to, you know. Oh, shoot they weren't some... anybody. They were no, just people. No, yeah, yeah. Just guys. I like the look of. That's interesting because you did a or project. Or had great faces, I should say. Or faces and yeah. from those meetings, from your meetings. Yeah. yeah. But that's interesting because you did a, a whole project on L.A. homeless. Yeah, did I mean, it was it well, kind of an that came that, that came later. <laughs> um, what I, it, I mean, the what, what happened is I took a, a portrait of a guy who's now dead, and um, he fascinated me. His name was Peter, and he was. He had AIDS at that, you know, at that time, uh, which at that time killed people. You know. And um, so there was this contradiction to Peter that he, he looked very healthy and looked very mm. well and had a great face, very interesting looking guy, but at the same time he, you know, he had AIDS. And I kind of, the, the paradox of that, I suppose, fascinated me. And I, anyway, I took a picture of him, a portrait, a, 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 I went to a very good black and white printer in the East End of London, and he um, 
liked the picture, put it up in his flat, and everybody that came to his apartment said how much they liked the picture. So they kind of gave me the, you know, oh, the right, momentum to right. carry on and take another one. Right, so right. That's how it kind of began. Right. Um, and um, from then on, I'm, you know, I sort of, I just carried on shooting black and white portraits. I wound up um, working or doing some work for Eric Clapton. Um, doing a blues album for Eric, which was cover. Yeah, and uh, went on the road for him for a little while. So were you shooting him on the road at yeah. the, during the concerts? Yes. Is that how the still on the film? I don't know. I, I, as I said at the beginning of this interview, it was kind of I just I've gone on this, you know, I've, I've sort of because it's a special expertise to be on a film set, and it's also you know sure. you have to ha you have to be invisible, right? Yes. Basically. In, in, in an ideal world, yes, yes. You, you, so, you, so you, you, how you, did you, you get your you, first <laughs> film thing like that? Still through Gary Oldman. Gary was making a film um, in London called Nil by Mouth, um, uh. and he'd seen the stuff I'd done for Eric. And oh, is that? Uh, yeah, uh. and. Um, and we met, and he, he and he hired me. So you went on the set with what, him. What was interesting about the Gary Oldman project was that he said to me that he 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 hired me because I had no experience of doing films, and he didn't want film stills. He didn't want conventional oh. film stills. He wanted something different. And so we sat down and talked about what he wanted, and I kind of got it straight away what he wanted. And what is it? What's different from regular stills uh, to someone who has something like that? Well. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a good question, actually. I mean, I, we looked at books um, and types of photography that, it, that interested him and, the, and kind of the whole look of the film. Uh, and, so they weren't just close Yeah, and I, and I was, you know, I was clueless as to how to provide normal film stills in those days. So I kind of just went with it and But you, and went, it on out. To, you went on to do Absolutely. normal yeah, film yeah. stills, I mean, right? Because yeah, <laughs> you've yeah, done yes. so many. I mean, I very, I very quickly had to because it, Gary introduced me to Luke Besson. Oh, Luke Besson, Luke, Luke, right. Luke was doing this huge film at Pinewood. He hired me. He took a huge risk and hired me. Uh, He's a great director. Really good. It was an interesting but guy. So yeah. did he have a style of stills that he wanted taken to? Yes. It seems well, no, he, he, he let me loose because I remember having this meeting with Luke and he, he said, oh, I, th I think you should do this and maybe you should. And he said, you know what, do what you want. Because what do you use the stills for? Publicity, right? Yeah. Or well, they, they also uh, as a uh, documentation? No, they, they, basically, they used to sell the film, aren't they? That's a, you know, they're to, they're to sell a movie. Oh, they used it to sell the movie well, I think, as well. I think, well that's what, I think that's what they do. Press with. release, I guess, sure. for press. Yeah. We're looking at them right here. I know. <laughs> yeah. the, the, I think these were all posed, or were they on? Um, no, these are. Yeah, these are. Did these you are look posed. through the Hollywood Museum because there's a lot of? I'm sure. Probably the same yeah. kind of work that you were doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, the work that you did was really influenced by the by your Past. actors you knew and the music you knew mm -hmm. and. All I guess. this background that maybe, we talked about. Maybe, yeah. And what yeah. are you using now for a camera? At the moment, I've been shooting with a with a, an old contacts film camera. Because I know here in LA, you used um, Leica for a while. Yes, I still I still use Leicas, and I use this contacts when I'm here. And, and when you did the homeless project, what were you using? A Leica. Then? Leica, and yeah. then you had an exhibition of that work, and yeah, I did. And. Um, the main, okay. the main exhibitions came from a film I, I did sort of quite recently with Gary Oldman, which was Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Oh, right. That was a great it. movie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> did I see your stills? <laughs> probably, you probably did. I probably saw your yeah. stills. And how long are you going to be in Los Angeles? Another week. And are you doing a project here? I am. I did, I did some photography um, on a... On a guy who's got a company called Maid Warn, which I found really interesting. So it's one person? It's one person. Okay, will we see it? Yes, you will. There's a magazine called the Laboratory Arts Collective are going to publish it. Okay, we're going uh, to see it. We're glad you came to visit today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, I couldn't go remember all the, the films. I go through the Hollywood Museum. I will. Go through the floors because okay. there's really interesting things here. Right. And you come back and go through the Hollywood Museum and keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. <laughs>